lot to be in picture. You're wonderful to see. Hello and welcome to Deep Dive Movie Reviews with my friend Steve Hackman and myself, James Marsh. This week is part of our Asian Classics series where we're taking a look at some of the best movies from around the re region from years gone by. This episode, we're talking about Alan Mack and Andrew Lau's Infernal Affairs. Hey, but before we talk Infernal Affairs, if you haven't already subscribed to Deep Dive Movie Reviews, it'd be a great favor to us if you went ahead and just hit that subscribe button. And while you're there, just hit the little bell next to it. That way you'll be notified every single time we upload a new video. And just as a spoiler, and even though Infernal Affairs is a 20-year-old movie, we do contain spoilers, so you have been warned. James, let's talk about one of my favorite Hong Kong films, Infernal Affairs. Okay, right. So the reason we're talking about this movie is it is 20 years old. It is the 20th anniversary and they have just completed a brand new 4K restoration of the film, which screened this weekend just past at the Hong Kong International Film Festival. So we thought, what better opportunity than to go and see it on the big screen uh, for me for the second time, but I believe for you for the first time. First time on uh, the big screen. Yeah. Right. And, and just revisit it and uh, see how it's how it's uh, endured two dec decades and uh, see if our opinion of it has changed at all. So just to set up the story very briefly, for those of you who don't know, this is set in Hong Kong, you know, it contemporarily about sort mm -hmm. of 2002. So it's about five years after the handover. And uh, it essentially follows the story of two moles, one who has been planted in the triads by the police force and simultaneously one who's been planted in the police force by the triads as they work their way through the various organizations you know so kind of word gets out or suspicions arise that they exist and it culminates inevitably with them being charged with seeking out who the other is and actually seeking who them, who they are yes by their own higher ups uh leading to this sort of fantastic uh action thriller cop procedural but also something a little bit sort of deeper, a little bit more profound about the nature of identity and uh, our place in all of this. So, Steve, where to begin? Yeah, you mentioned identity and the handover. And for people that are not from Hong Kong or maybe not familiar, the handover that occurred in 1997, where Hong Kong was a British colony and was handed back to uh, mainland China, which resumed sovereignty in, as I said, 1997, which the, the movie... Uh, notes because the earlier scenes when they have their military their police uniforms on and the insignia you see the crowns and you see the mm. the the colonial insignia but then later in the film you see the the flags have changed the insignia has changed to uh, Hong Kong being a special administrative region of the People's Republic so for me it's nostalgic because it really chronicles these different times that I have lived in Hong Kong I lived in Hong Kong when it was still a British uh, colony. I lived in it for the years following the handover. And James, for me, and probably like yourself, it's, it was very nostalgic. I lived in Hong Kong during the time when it was still a British colony. And then seeing some of the slight changes that occurred after, but not, not radical, uh, during the early years that it became a special administrative region. And then subsequently, we're 25 years on. And the whole identity issue that you mentioned is something that the Hong Kong people have been wrestling with during the whole time that I've lived here. Is that who are we? Are we, oh, you know, we a lot of us grew up under the British, but we're Chinese. But sometimes we don't always feel the connection with the mainland and to the degree that that they would like us to to have that connection. And then obviously some people do feel that connection. So there's always an identity issue that is underlying the surface here in Hong Kong. And I think this movie kind of, in a meta way, addresses, you know, what side am I on? Who, who am absolutely. I really, who am I really working and playing for here? No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the struggles of these two central characters, I think very, very deliberately reflect sort of this, this sense of instability or this sort of identity crisis that the city was going through at this time. I mean, you've got uh, the two central characters, you've got Yang played by, uh, so Yan played by uh, Tony Leung, uh, who is is a cop deep undercover in the triads and gets to a point where he's been undercover for so long that he 
you know, routinely has to break the law and he barely does anything that could be conceived as police work. And then when the last remaining uh, superiors die, who are the only ones who know his secret identity, who know that he's anything other than just another thug in the gang, when they when they die, he's sort of cut off and he's set adrift. And he's like, well, well, who am I now? And, you know, who do I answer to? You know, he feels like um, Hong Kong when the British kind of like pull out, if you like. Yeah, and, yeah. and the city's kind of like, well, what now? What do I do? Yeah. You know, because now my my allegiances are no longer evident, obvious mm -hmm. or or you know, to anybody. And I appear to be just another one of those so you know there's an element of his plight that i think a lot of hong kong chinese people were feeling when they were like now i just look like another chinese person and to all intents and purpose people are just going to see me as another chinese person they're not going to know that i have this special connection and affiliation with this other sort of sovereign power yes yes whereas and... andy lau's character ming who is the triad deep 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 undercover with the cops doesn't want the role that he's had anymore either mm -hmm. you know he's starting to feel conflicted he's starting to feel that he'd actually rather do good mm -hmm. than break the law all the time he's got pressure at home and you know he's and he's succeeding in his mm -hmm. job of being a cop he's getting promoted and he's like actually i like this lifestyle more and it's becoming more and more stressful for me to you know secretly report back to sam the tri eric zhang's triad boss and what I'd really rather do is sever all those ties and, and embrace this new life yes. that I have. Uh, that, that, that sure, it was it was created on um, sort of uh, on artificial terms, if you like. But that's where I feel more comfortable, which is kind of, I guess, the other side of the of the Hong Kong coin. Right. If, right. If you it, like. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a, spe a spectrum of identities here mm. in Hong Kong. And and, and there is conflict at times because of where people identify on that spectrum and uh, unfortunately because we, we don't you know it, it we love to be binary and say oh you're you're chinese or you're hong kong sure. chinese or you, you know it becomes easy but again like we were just saying in a previous um review we we're doing of only murders in the building we were saying we love to categorize people and say you're a this or you're a that but once you hear the story of where they come from and the background and the experiences they have, suddenly it's much more nuanced. It's not so easy to just say you're this and you're that. And, you know, Andy Lau's character, you know, typifies it. He's, he's got a fiance that is looking to him to have a certain kind of identity. Mm -hmm. And so he is struggling with maintaining this identity while secretly harboring a second identity and it, it's the conflict of those two that you see building up in him through the whole film and and just le leads to the the tension which is wonderfully done in this story oh absolutely i mean i think the great skill of the film is that it's able to articulate all of these feelings and all of these different perspectives and viewpoints solely within the genre confines of you know a police v triad undercover thriller you know, it never breaks character to pontificate no, about, no. oh, woe is me, my plight, who am I, blah, 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 you know, and it and it never kind of knowingly winks at the camera and goes, you know what I'm really talking about, right? Right, right. You know, but what it does is quite cleverly and completely solely using the, the tools at its disposal. And that's why I think you get the this I, these iconic scenes, not least of the final showdown, where you have uh, Yan and Ming on the rooftop of a random building uh, with the backdrop of of Hong Kong of yeah. ca specifically Kowloon side in the background which is attached to the mainland and therefore it's you know you could argue is sort of representing China if you like just as the backdrop for this conversation this standoff that they're having about well who exactly are you and who exactly am I and who do you want to be and who do I want to be and does anybody know does anybody care does it matter at all uh you know we are the re really that they're, they're obviously two sides of the same person you know they are they are a split personality if you like yeah, yeah. and they're the ones looking at each other going we are the only people who know exactly how you are feeling yeah. and exactly the truth at the heart of your identity only and the, and the only way we can reconcile this is for one of us to kill the other 
right is right. to pick is to pick a side and inevitably that's that's what happens quite tragically yeah you know it almost midway through this story only one of these guys is coming out alive you just don't know which one yeah yeah i mean and so i think the the film that at the time when it came out that was uh everybody sort of pointed their fingers at it uh certainly in the west was michael mann's heat oh uh, yes you yeah know, which which has that sort of same sort of steely blue gray aesthetic, urban aesthetic to it and again is all just about this sort of this standoff between uh the cop and the criminal you know who on any other day w- could be best buddies you know they yes. they really sort of live their life by the same code of ethics they're just uh pointed in different directions yeah and, really, and towards and, different and pl- goals and played by the wonderfully wonderful tony lung and andy lao because both of them play these characters so well and like you say they don't have to telegraph all of their inner feelings or their uh, you know, the, the dialogues that they would have going on in their heads, or they're not communicating. Okay. Like you said, th- this is how I'm feeling. This is what it, everything is done through the, the, the tension, the facial expressions, um, even the occasional encounters that the two of them have, like in the, in the stereo shop where mm. they're already kind of pitting them not against one another at this, but realizing these, these two characters, fate has, determined that their paths are going to cross this this is shakespearean in nature they the fates that are governing their two journeys go beyond their decision making they're going to you know they they are funneling towards a tragic conclusion which we get to bear witness to oh absolutely i mean the thing i like about that early um sort of meet up in the stereo store is at that point they don't know who each other are Mm -hmm. at all they're literally just shopkeeper and patron right. at that time but even then you know they both have a similar way about each other you can tell that they're kind of instantly clicking you mm-hmm. know there's almost a spark of attraction between the two <laughs> of them and you realize that they're both they both appreciate oldies as they mm-hmm. call them like the, the the old classic music the old classic cantonese pop songs and it's only by them collaborating is that they find the best way of appreciating it. Because yeah. Tony Lang's character is like, oh, okay, right. Well, you, what you want to do is you want to use this amp and you want to use these cables. And so they sit down and listen. And Andy Lang gets up and goes, hang on, no, actually, these cables are better. Mm-hmm. You know, and so they're pooling, they're pooling their knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in order to um to it to achieve sort of this sort of you know, final state of perfection, and it's. I think it's great foreshadowing for for how their plight is going to play out because, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're both heading in the same direction, but from mm-hmm. but from opposite ends. Now, see if they had just done what our friends in RRR had done when they made that bromance connection, they could have taken on the British together. But <laughs> that's it. Tony Lung sat upon Andy Lau's <laughs> shoulders, and they could have fought him, fought them off <laughs> one by one. That's right. But. Uh, but alas, it was not to be. But you know, RRR follows the exact same tradition of mm-hmm. of these kind of um, sort of anti heroes, you know, conflicting yet complementary anti heroes uh, who, you, in that case, unite against a common a common purpose. Right. But um, it has been long uh, sort of uh, exploited and indulged in. Hong mm-hmm. Kong cinema, this idea that cops and cops and robbers, if you like, cops and yes. triads, are two are are essentially the same. You know, they both worship the same god. They have the shrines to the same gods yes. in their in their um in their offices, and they, you know they live their lives by the same code. And inevitably, in a lot of these movies, like Better Tomorrow or The Killer yeah. or Hard Boiled or whatever, it's it's about them you you know teaming up at the right. end in order to. Uh, in order to sort of beat beat the real villain. Yeah, I was wondering about how Sam, I, I, for, for a brief moment, I was thinking, you know, he's using Buddhism. That, that initial scene is set at the Temple of 10,000 Buddhas. It's another reason I love this film is being a Hong Konger. You just go, I've been there. I've been there. And that oh, yeah. initial that, that initial scene where the uh, Sam is the triad leader and he's got his uh, triad new recruits that he's going to place in the police department. But that's all filmed at the Temple of 10,000 Buddhas in Sha Tin, which was where I lived for six years. Not 
actually in the temple, but mm. we lived literally next door to it. I would be on my roof and it would be right there. And so um, I'm like, oh, that's the temple of 10,000 Buddhas. And y- y- basically they're doing this whole criminal activity at a very holy place. And I was wondering, would, would they do that in a church or would they do that in the synagogue? It just seemed out of place if I thought it through logically to, to have him asking the gods and being all religious and then doing this criminal activity. Well, I, suppose, I mean, there is a kind of very sort of Buddhist um, sort of mantra underpinning all of the drama, isn't there? I mean, Infernal Affairs, the, the title uh, re- refers to this That's idea right. that they are kind of trapped in one of the circles of hell. You're right. Continuous hell, I think they called it. Yeah, uh, which yeah. is obviously the position that both of these two characters are in. You know, neither of them is 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 doing the job that they want to do, nor that they signed up to do. Uh, and yet they are stuck. They are stuck doing it because of uh, because of their circumstances. Neither one of these guys is happy through this whole film. They are no. they are just miserable. In fact, the always wonderful Anthony Wong plays the boss and the one guy who knows of Yan's that he's the mole undercover for the police. And when Yan is telling him, you know, you told me three years and then it was another three years. It's been 10 years now. And and Anthony Wong says, I'm the only one who knows I can delete the file and you can go be a triad. You know, if will that make you happier? Like rather than have this tension in your life, like mm. you're always a deceiver, that you're always having this double life. I can delete your file today and you can go live a life as a successful triad. You know, you're trusted, you're loved in that world. You've built yourself up through the ranks. You don't have to do this anymore. And, and the tension of, yeah, my God, that would just be so much easier if you just deleted that file and I can just go do my thing. But he's, he's, racked with a conscience as well he yeah he's a good guy he he's signed a good up guy to be a, yeah, good guy, a cop you know? he wanted to be a cop and he still wants to be a cop right in fact he right. even tells his he even tells his uh therapist i'm a cop like somebody's besides that one guy in the world needs to know that i'm a police officer she's like yeah yeah me too yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she yeah. Just, she's just like yeah, yeah whatever <laughs> whatever whatever you need to be yeah, yeah. yes that's or whatever you say darling kind of thing. Yeah. but i mean yeah anthony wong is absolutely brilliant in this you know he's the kind of father figure he's the one that yeah. like you said uh is his one lifeline and uh and, the, and in one of my favorite scenes of the movie uh he's uh he's tragically he's tragically killed Yes. Which, you know, not only in and of itself is it a horribly violent, audacious act where he's tossed off the roof of a building. And you don't see him get tossed off. You just see him land from the street on top of a taxi, mm-hmm. spread eagled on his back, right in front of Yan. Which not only is it like, oh, my God, my friend has just died, but he's just like, there goes my lifeline. Yes. You know, yeah. there goes the only person who who is still alive who knew that I'm really one of the good guys. I am I am now condemned yeah. to this life. And there's no there's now no going back. I stalled one too many times. And yeah. there is now no going back. And it's got this but, beautiful sort of almost sort of choral ballad yeah. playing over the top. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. And just to say if we are if we are sort of name checking places in in Hong Kong, I used to live on that street. Like yeah, at, the time, say, yeah. at the time yeah. when they were when they were filming it, that was literally at the end of my block on, mm-hmm. in uh, in Shang Wan. I was like, oh, cool, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun fact too. Um, it's been a while since I saw Infernal Affairs. I completely forgot that Anthony Wong died. So watching it the other day, I mean, I remember how it ends and I remember the how the story goes. But for some reason, I totally forgot he was going to die. So when he fell out that window. I just thought, oh gosh, I forgot. No. Yeah. Oh, it's so it's such a kind of sledgehammer moment as well. Yeah, it comes it, out yeah. of nowhere. It's done so well too. And actually his dying is really uh pivotal in the film. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the real turning point where he's like, right, I I if I'm gonna do anything, I've got to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and that's where and that's where Andy Lau has to really uh rise up and he becomes the new kind of boss. And it just becomes a real cat and mouse game from there. The tension, the stakes are elevated, the tension rises, and it uh, it it all funnels down to that great scene on top of a rooftop with Hong Kong in the background. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it should come as no. Um, I think I think people know that this is the movie that the the Departed is mm-hmm. a remake of, 
uh, which obviously is, you know, Martin Scorsese's big hit. And um, they did change a number of things. And I just wanted to point out one thing that they changed because there's the, I think there is a weak point to Infernal Affairs. And I think it is the female characters. Mm-hmm. You got Sammy Cheng as Andy Lau's fiance, <laughs> who is trying to write a novel about somebody with a split personality. And she can't work out whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. Obviously, she's basing it on her fiance. Uh, and she's kind of wrestling with that. But other than that, she doesn't really do very much. I mean, her and Andy Lau have obviously been in movies together many, many times, you know, playing romantically uh, uh, in coupled characters. So they have this kind of very relaxed shorthand with each other and that really uh is is apparent on screen you know i wouldn't be at all surprised if those scenes were entirely uh uh improvised Mm -hmm. uh, rather than scripted you know there's just a kind of loose naturalism to them and yet they kind of feel out of step with the rest of the film and maybe that's why you know maybe they were just they were just shot in a different style i think the films with between kelly chen's therapist and tony lung are better I mean, their relationship doesn't really amount to much either. No, no. Um, but it, but it at least feels in the same sort of tone, tone as the rest of the right, uh, as the rest of the film. And then you have this very bizarre sort of single scene between Tony Lung and uh, Elva Shao, uh, where he meets her randomly in the street, and you realize they had a previous relationship, and and that they've probably had a child together who's now six or seven years old. And I get it. You know, it's, it's a representation of the life that got away from him and that, that, you know, the normal life. And it's another lifeline, if you like, that he he could have had, but in all honesty, because the rest of the film is so tight and so carefully constructed and everything pays off, you know, there is all this foreshadowing and paying off and everything is balanced so perfectly. Those sequences with with the, the 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 women and it's no fault of the women but just those those sequences always feel a little bit wobbly just feel a right. little bit kind of different to the rest of the movie and the reason i bring up the departed is because i think that that is the one major change that william monaghan made to his in his script to the departed uh is he made all of those characters one character i mean he got rid of like the 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 ex-girlfriend with the with the kid uh, but he made the therapist character and the fiance into the same character. And it makes perfect sense. You know, she is she is a, a therapist working for the police force that Leonardo DiCaprio's character is is uh, a patient of who right. Matt Damon starts dating. It makes perfect sense. And in keeping with the sort of two sides of the same coin uh, idea that they would both be attracted to the same woman. And involved with the same woman, and it's yeah. it's just a shame. It's just a shame that sort of uh, that Infernal Affairs doesn't have that element. No, I agree. I think Infernal Affairs is a stronger film, but yes, bringing those two characters together and then having just yet another dynamic which brings these two together in a way that again that fate is determined to mess with both of these guys' lives as much as as much as mm-hmm. it can. Yeah, so. I mean, and it also sort of uh, elevates the probability that they're going to cross paths over and over again. Yeah. You know, if they're both literally having to sort of spend time with the same woman on a day-to-day basis, it only heightens those stakes. Uh, you know, and while we're at it, I mean, the other big difference is uh, Mark Wahlberg's character. Right, uh, who, yeah. who isn't even Who isn't even in... In, in uh, Furl Affairs. Affairs. at all, yeah. Yeah. But they got Mark, Mark Wahlberg, you know, so... They, they do, gotta, and I think yeah, the great irony gotta... is that out of that entire cast, he was the one that got the Oscar nomination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, deserve it. But, you know, when you're there with DiCaprio and Damon and and, and Nicholson yeah. and Martin Sheen and, and everybody else and Wahlberg snacks the, snaps the only, uh, the only Oscar nom, you're like, well played. I, I just don't like when they accepted the award for Best Picture and they said it was based mm. on a... Uh, a Japanese movie oh. and I just I remember thinking when I was watching that live going ah you know what I looked <laughs> I looked this up and it was actually when he won for best screenplay it was oh, at, okay. it was at the Oscars but it wasn't the best picture it was when Monaghan gets his Oscar for best screenplay William Monaghan for The Departed 
William Monaghan based his screenplay about Boston mobsters on the Japanese film Infernal Affairs. That they said, you know, his script was a, was adapted from the Japanese film Infernal Affairs. Just, okay. Ugh. It's been a few years, but I, I mm. remember watching it live going, no! Oh! <laughs> James, before we kind of wrap this up, the one little story I want to tell about Infernal Affairs is I actually saw Infernal Affairs in the States because I said I've been here in Hong Kong for so long, but I actually was living in Colorado in the early 2000s and attending grad school at the University of Colorado before we moved back to Hong Kong. And I was, while I was there, I was working at Barnes and Noble doing community relations. And we, I would always have authors coming in and they had this British mystery writer named Denise Mina. You can find her. She's a accomplished author. She came into the store. She signed her books and we started chatting and somehow we got on to Hong Kong because I think we were trying to get back to Hong Kong as soon as possible. And for whatever reason, Hong Kong came up and she says, oh, Steve, I just saw the most incredible Hong Kong movie. It's called Infernal Affairs. And I think I went out maybe that day to the video station in Boulder, Colorado, which was one of the premier video stores in you could get any movie there. Got Infernal Affairs, went home and watched it. So I want it was wonderful last Saturday, the Hong Kong International Film Festival, to finally see one of my favorite Hong Kong films on the big screen. Oh, and it and it did. It looked great, you know, particularly mm-hmm. seeing those shots where they're on the rooftop and you see the whole of the harbor in the background on a beautiful sunny day. It was gorgeous. You know, I I did see it uh when uh, it first came out. Uh I mean that's kind of one of the things I like about the movie is that it came out about a year after I had moved to Hong Kong. And so the okay. Hong Kong in the movie is very much the Hong Kong that I moved to. If right. You, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And so, uh, and that was one of the, uh, one of the first, I mean, I didn't immediately jump on board watching like loads of Hong Kong movies when I first mm-hmm. got here. So that was quite an early one that I went to see on the big screen, but mm-hmm. you know, that was 20 years ago. So yeah, it yeah. was a great opportunity to see it again. You know, and just we're going to be looking at Asian classics and you know more about this than me, but it for me, it always it it invokes some nostalgia, not only for the Hong Kong of that period, but also when I first moved here, you know, Hong Kong cinema was at its heyday. It was the early 90s. And, you know, Hong Kong, John Woo and a number of of directors and and, uh, films were were known like we knew Hong Kong cinema. And this just was one of the apex of Hong Kong cinema. And it seems like in recent years, Hong Kong cinema doesn't have the reputation that it enjoyed during the time of Infernal Affairs. Is there, why is that? Well, it's it's an, it's an interesting point, actually, because, uh, I mean, there's, it's, it's all to do with really with the handover and the aftermath of the handover. I think a lot of people... Uh, was were scared at the time of the handover. They didn't know what was going to happen next. You know what the fate of Hong Kong, what the fate of the industry was going to be. And you saw even before the handover in the early nineties, this sort of this migration of talent in all sectors, but including the film industry, out of Hong Kong. And so that's when Jackie Chan started making movies in Hollywood. That's when uh, John Woo and Ringo Lam and Ronnie Yu and Choi Hart all sort of started going over to Hollywood and started making movies. Actually, someone who was a really big part of helping them do that was Jean-Claude Van Damme, actually. Because he had come over to Hong Kong and made movies over here in in the 80s and, you know, formed these relationships with people like John Woo and Choi Hark and Ringo Lam. And then when he had the opportunity to make Hollywood movies, he had said, oh, but I want John Woo to direct this movie. And they're like, who? And they're like, well, yes, no, Woo. The Mm -hmm. guy guy who did uh, The Killer and Harbaugh. I want him. So that he helped bring them over by insisting that they direct his first couple of like proper Hollywood movies. Right. So movies like sort of hard target and, um, or double team. And, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. Knock, yeah. knock off and movies like that. Uh, all have, um, all have Hong Kong directors. And so he was quite, he was quite sort of important in that. And obviously John Woo was brought over. Um, Chow Yun Fat came over as well, did like bulletproof <laughs> yeah. monk, and um, so I think they were sort of exploring their options at that time. So actually sort of it, things were already kind of on the on the decline. And you had a little resurgence uh, a year or two before Infernal Affairs when um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon mm-hmm. obviously did very really well in, in the US, made like a, uh, a lot of money at the box office and um, obviously 
got like four Oscars. And that's a Hong Kong Taiwanese uh, co-production. And so that kind of renewed interest in the big period martial arts spectacle, right. which were very expensive and people had sort of stopped investing in. Uh, and that and then Hero the following year made was like one of the first uh, foreign language films to make over $100 million at the US box office. Mm. And, um, and then Infernal Affairs came along. And that actually sort of really renewed it. They were like, oh, we, we can still do this. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got we've got the stars, we've got the talent behind the camera and all the rest of it. And so in very quick succession, in classic Hong Kong style, bang, bang, you, you made, they made two sequels, well, a prequel and a sequel, you know, within a year of the first movie coming out. And then you got a lot of sort of sort of knockoffs. Yeah. A lot of a lot of movies about cops and about triads and about undercover cops in the triads and vice yeah. versa. Uh, and it lasted for a few years. But then but then sort of uh, the the wind got knocked out of their sails again. And and you see the state that the Hong Kong industry is in right now, where um, essentially the, the, the kind of the China market opened up. So on the one hand, there was an opportunity for everything made in Hong Kong to go play in China for the first time. But because it now could, it now had to, as far mm. as the financiers were concerned. So if it couldn't, because of its politics or its violence or its nudity or its gore, or it's just sort of a amoral depiction of crime, which was often sort of the problem in terms of these triad movies and what have you, um, the people weren't going to invest in them. And there were opportunities to make big budget movies on the mainland uh, that a lot of, a lot of the directors in particular decided, Oh, well, I'm just going to go do that then. Yeah. You know, go make the big movies that are going to be seen by half a billion people mm -hmm. or whatever. I'm going to go do that. Uh, and you, and unfortunately now the Hong Kong industry has very little left. You know, it's just yeah. got this sort of emerging generation of student filmmakers that want to wait, make tiny budgeted, socially aware movies that are very specific to Hong Kong. But that's about all you can, all that can be made in Hong Kong these days, due to uh, due to financing. Yeah, uh, it's sad to hear, but hopefully we'll see a resurgence uh, mm -hmm. in the days to come. Yes, hopefully. Well, that's James and I's thoughts on Infernal Affairs. Obviously, we love this movie, and we think you will too. If you haven't seen it, it is available on Netflix. So sit down, watch it. We know you'll enjoy it. Then let us know what do you think of it. Let us know your comments in the box below, James. That's right. Yeah, I think actually the Criterion Collection just announced that they're bringing out the new 4K restorations of the trilogy uh, towards the end of the year. Um, so there's an opportunity for physical media folks to uh, to pick it up there, and I'm sure I'll be doing that. Uh, but yeah, let us know what other films you would like us to watch in this Asian classic series that we are launching uh, from anywhere in the region. Japan, Korea, you know, you name it. Uh, let us know what you'd like us to hear about and share your thoughts about Infernal Affairs, other Hong Kong classics that you'd like us to talk about in the comments below. Till next episode. Bye. Goodbye.